Hi, my name's Eric. I'm one of the guys who's just completed Trainer Trainer, and I've found the six sessions incredibly helpful. The content has allowed me to think about asking helpful questions, to develop a culture in my groups where people are learning and being vulnerable, and to train planters to plan, implement, and sustain gospel growth. The past 12 weeks or so have been incredible. Um, the material we went through has been brilliant. The online sessions have been, have been great. Um, I, up to this point, have existed in largely the kind of teacher-preacher mode, um, where I, when I'm trying to communicate or teach something, it's usually delivered with me just speaking at a group, a group of people, um, and then listening and hopefully absorbing some of what I've had to say. This ma this material has really challenged me, and I just made an announcement just uh, two weeks ago at the church service that we're going to be we're going to revamp the church's training program. And we're going to move into much more of discussions and, and application and just where they are really discussing these things and, and putting in the practices these principles that we've been learning here it's encouraging to understand that um, it's not our job as trainers to uh, simply lecture and teach the material but to create a learning environment in which all of the participants engage and work collectively in order to um, achieve new information that can be immediately applied in the ministry context. I remember one one of the phrases that stuck, uh, it, it, it still stuck in my mind. It is that, uh, and it, it is pure gospel, um, is that um, the, the, the transformation, the church planter transformation, is not depend on this on us it's depend on christ's work we always have started our sessions with applying uh, the gospel to our hearts um, we we can only teach people uh, as deep as we go ourselves so as we have been together in this uh, great fellowship with a uh, wonderful man and it's been encouraging for me to to be with you and also as we have, I've seen you apply the gospel to your hearts and it has been, it has taught me how to apply the gospel to my heart as well. You know, I came thinking, I'm actually a pretty good trainer. And and then I go, actually, I, I think I was a pretty decent teacher, but I knew nothing about training. And after after coming, coming through this, uh, I see such a, a big contrast between the between just teaching and, and training that there are two different two different goals um, teaching is part of training but but uh, you can you can teach and, and yet not train and so after going going through this uh, with you guys I, I really feel at least like the concepts are so much more clear it's also provided me with a cohort of like-minded pastors who want to start gospel movements in their cities and as we share our experiences and the skills that we're developing, it's really encouraging me to continue to spur on to see more people come to know Jesus in my city. The vision of City City Europe is to create movements of the gospel in the cities of Europe. The vision basically describes why we exist. Why do we exist? Well, we do exist because we feel called to the cities of Europe to create movements of the gospel there through church planting. The 21st century is a time where more and more people live in cities and we see that at the same time, church feels less and less able to do a church or to apply the, the gospel into a, to a, a young urban post-Christian, post-modern, post-secular society. And we do feel called to go to those places and to plant new churches. This is what City City was all about from the beginning. Why we exist, why we started what we started. Because some leaders felt called to go to urban places in Europe to create movements of the gospel. Through church planting, this is our very specific contribution, we think a movement of the gospel is more than church planting in the city, but we feel called to contribute the planting of healthy new churches, then in collaboration with the existing churches to seek a movement of the gospel in the city. 
our dream basically so what we dream and pray about is that we want to see revival revival in every city in europe in every country we do believe if we started in the cities then it will spread out through, through the whole country through the whole europe and this is what we do we, tr we do train and mentor and equip and coach people who become church planters who are who then create churches in order to seek a movement of the gospel in the city and to change the whole city with the gospel. So we exist basically to create those movements of the gospel. And if one day in the future, um, every city in Europe has a self-running, uh, owned by local people, movement of the gospel through church planting within it, then city to city doesn't need to exist anymore. But until that day, it needs a network or a movement like City City to help those people to create those movements of the gospel. This is the vision of City City Europe. Well, City City Europe is all about helping people who have a shared vision or want to achieve something that they are need help with. So it is, if you want to plant a church, either you are a church planter or someone who wants to be part of a church planting project, or if you and your church have the vision to plant a church, to send someone out uh, to plant a church in a city, and maybe in your city or another city, then City City Europe can help you. We do help, we are able to help you to first connect you to other leaders in your city or region to get some support there in the relationship and asking questions and a learning community and something like that. We can help you uh, through the way we train you, how we connect you with a gospel coach, uh, how we can, we can, there's a lot of material, a lot of things that we can help you with specific question, but mainly it is a lot about the relationships. So we can help you to connect you with other people all over Europe or in your city or in your region that help you to plant that church. We, we believe if you want to plant a church in a city in Europe, then you shouldn't do that alone. You shouldn't do that alone on your, on your own. You need a team and your team and you need some people around you that support you. So in the best case, you need someone who becomes your mentor and you're kind of an apprentice or a trainee. You need a trainer or someone who, or in the best case, actually, there's a learning community that gets trained by someone who's an equipped trainer and you need a gospel coach. So these are the three relationships that are at least the ones that we would suggest. Sometimes they're not there, but that would be the best case scenario. Saying all of that, we want to support people who want to plant churches or who want to send out church planners and all the way from identifying assessing, training, coaching, mentoring, sending out, supporting, multiplying a church, all of that. We want to be a supportive network and movement around that path. And we're quite experienced. And I think we have high quality material and good trained people who can help you on the way. And if you think that is something we can help you with, just connect, connect through our website, connect through our social media, or connect locally with the leaders who are part of City City Europe and we are very eager to help everyone possible who is about creating movements of the gospel in the cities of Europe through planting churches.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this very exciting conversation with uh, my friends here, Stefan and Tiago. Uh, my name is Brandon O'Brien, and I'm the Director of Content Development for Redeemer City to City. Uh, I am the, um, the lone American in this conversation today, and uh, so that, that means my job is to bring blind confidence and enthusiasm about all the great things we can do. <laughs> uh, and I um, hope can ask questions to prompt great discussion here um, about the challenges of evangelism uh, in Europe in the 21st century. So um, with me today on the call is uh, Tiago Cabaco from Lisbon and Stefan Pus from Frankfurt. And uh, I'm really excited to talk with you guys today. Thank you for Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Thank you. So before, before we get started and jump into discussion, uh, one quick housekeeping item. Uh, we will have a time of question and answer at, uh, at the second half or our last third or so of this conversation. So please feel free to go ahead and start submitting questions uh, wherever you're watching this, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to see those shortly. Um, and before we dive into the main part of our conversation, which is about the challenges of evangelism in Europe, uh, I did want to start off by uh, acknowledging that one commonality that the three of us have, uh, in addition to our interest in evangelism, uh, is an interest in music, which is represented in both of your screens <laughs> right now, not in mine. Um, <clears throat> now, we, we have different experiences. I am very clearly an unaccomplished musician. The last time I played in a group, I was a teenager and I would leave it to my classmates to tell you whether we were any good or not, but we were earnest and we were loud. We were all those other things. Um, but I was curious if, if we were to form a trio uh, or find someone else for a quartet for the next city to city Europe conference, um, what style of music could the three of us pull off together? What would be our, what's our genre? So I'll start, I play acoustic guitar and I'm in sort of like the American folk rock, uh, you know, the Eagles, the Allman Brothers, that sort of blues folk sort of country. Um, how well would that jive with your, with your backgrounds? Country and Western, there's always something ling ling in there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was born on, on 1977, so it's the year that punk uh, changed the world. And the first album that, that I got to play, um, because I got a bass guitar, it was my first instrument that I tried to play it seriously. And it was 1992 or 1993, and it was never mine. And so from Nirvana. So uh, I learned it, it was not that difficult. So, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm leaning for the more rock and roll and, 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 and punk uh, side, but probably yeah. Stefan can save us from, from, from rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually I was born in 77 too, and I did listen to a lot of that stuff too. And interesting enough, my seven-year-old son is now listening to Nirvana again. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's totally coming back. Uh, yeah, my music, <laughs> My little style that I would put into our tree would a little bit more funky and uh, yeah, and uh, it would be interesting because we would have two bass guitars being played. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, we could play bass and and Brandon could just sing to it or something. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. it would sound very experimental and 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 it would make us look um, smart. I think. Yep. Yeah. 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 Probably yeah. we wouldn't sound that good, but we would look smart. Well, that was like Nirvana, right? They were a trio that they, they looked yeah. good, but they didn't sound that great. That makes sense. <laughs> if people don't understand it, we'll just call it avant-garde and we'll... Yeah, it, it, yes. that's it. That's, it. that's <laughs> the secret. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I'm excited about this conversation. And as many people who are watching will know, this is a continuation or sort of um, public... Uh, um, manifestation of ongoing discussions at City to City Europe about evangelism. And um, I have had the opportunity to get you to know you each a little in, um, in those settings. And I'm glad to, to be able to share some of that conversation here publicly, more publicly. Um, I think the first thing that would be useful for us to discuss when we think about the challenges of evangelism um, in Europe or anywhere, 
Um, one set of challenges that we have to address um, are challenges that exist because of our church culture or our Christian culture. Um, we might call those internal challenges for evangelism. Um, and so I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you what you think are some of the sort of main challenges um, within the Christian um, communities that you're part of that, that make evangelism difficult or prevent um, effective evangelism where you serve. You go, Stefan, you go. Okay. Yeah, I think, let me start with one. I think it's a very profound one. I think that um, as a church, I don't know if we can even say that, you know, as a church in Europe, but what I see is that in many church settings in different parts of Europe, it almost looks equal very often that there's an internal challenge and that is we don't use the gospel, which is the thing that we want to say when we event, when we evangelize, when we share people with people. Um, the gospel is not anymore the one thing that we apply to every question in life. So somewhere down in history, somewhere back in history, someone somehow needs to have told the church that the, the gospel is a answer to one question in life. And that is very simply just the question, you know, where will you be when you die? And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relevant of the gospel that is not for this life, but for the next, that what, what comes after life. And it seems like sometime, some generations ago, that was a very pressing and relevant question to many, many Europeans inside and outside the church. And the gospel was the answer. But the gospel is much more than just a answer to one question in life. I think it is the answer to every question in life and my whole city. And we, even among ourselves, don't use it for that anymore. So we only use the gospel when we evangelize people. And that means we share the gospel about as an answer to one question in life with people who have never heard it. So I think an internal challenge, why it is so hard for us to actually share the gospel in Europe is that even inside the church, we're not using the gospel to make it real to, to us, so among us anymore. So if we talk about challenges in our own lives, like challenges in my marriage, challenges at my work, challenges in my, with my neighbors, challenges with my own whatever fear or self-worth, we're not using the gospel to address that even among us. And that is an internal, so almost like not training it enough among us even more. And I think that's a big problem. And somewhere behind that is this assumption that is just a answer to one question in life and not the answer to every question in life in the whole city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would totally agree. And I would just add that on the top of that, even, even the, the question about the other life, the life that was to come after we die, it got even, that question got more complicated because mm -hmm. uh, right now, um, in a way, we kind of lost the ability of feeling lost and then needing s some kind of answer for what happens uh, next, uh, this life. And so uh, in terms of, um, I think that, uh, Tim Keller really explained it well uh, in that uh, when he, he wrote How to Reach the West Again, when he, 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 he talked a little bit about saving ourselves from our need of salvation. So even the ancient question that Christian faith was going to answer uh, about our need uh, to know where we would be after dying, even, even that changed so much then that right now, one of the, the, the things that I really think it's hard when engaging people is that um, people simply do not feel lost and do not feel, feel the, the need of being saved from anything. Of course, I'm making a, a broad simplification. And, and the other day I was talking to a friend and I was telling him that um, 
when we are re reading the gospel and the story of our Lord Jesus, it's fascinating that uh, at the beginning of his ministry, when, when he's having a meal with sinners, um, the worst kind of reaction that happens is that the scribes and so the religious people, uh, they don't connect with Jesus because they do not feel the urge to, being, to be saved. So they think they, they are already saved. And it's when Jesus will say that he comes from, the, how, how would you say, the sick. He comes from the sick. And so one of, one of the most difficult issues to, to, to tackle, I think, is that we no longer feel sick. We no longer feel spiritually sick. And so when we present a, a gospel that engages with this kind of uh, language, saved lost it's like we have to invent a new a new kind of um alphabet so people mm -hmm. even that they lost the ability of feeling lost and and mm -hmm. at least for me it's one of the the difficult things that we have to 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 deal with when talking yeah. about jesus and i think as a result what we see in many churches is that evangelism almost becomes a department you know, it becomes mm -hmm. that little group of really gifted people, something a little bit crazy. But like, it's good that they're there, but you know, yes. it's not something that everything in the whole church should be all about. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it almost becomes this special thing for these special people. Um, and not, it is not the whole purpose of the whole church mm -hmm. anymore, which I think that was Jesus' idea. And it was at the very early church, it was, very much it. And, and Stefan, would you agree that sometimes the more evangelistic types in our churches, they tend to, to look like the, the extroverts mm -hmm. and, and we frame the thing as a kind of um, character thing and, and, and not as something that is, is, is connected with the gospel being the answer to all things in our life. Mm -hmm. And so the experts they will talk a lot about a lot about faith, but then it, it's not a culture really uh, deep in our local churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not something that everybody's involved in. Mm -hmm. and I think it is a challenge, and I think you know, to to be intentional about you know sharing the gospel with everyone is a challenge, of course, but it's not a normality among us anymore, and it's not a normality that everyone inside the church kind of uses not only inside the church but even outside so i think the word that you used culture is very key in that so mm -hmm. to change this you know challenge you know how could we come back to a culture where this is more than normal yeah but mm -hmm. that is not there right now it's a challenge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well and your this discussion makes me wonder um stefan you can start i'm curious how tiago would answer this too but what where are people finding the answers to the other questions? What if there if people in our churches have stopped viewing the gospel as the answer to the questions beyond eternal destination, right? What what are the sources of answers for them for those questions about their marriage and about their fears and about their career and and all the other things that that the, the gospel could address if if the, we would let it well if you're still very religious so if you're inside the church and the bible for example has a high view and you, you have a high view of the bible then you may just look for like laws or you know tips or so in the bible but then you don't use then then you have maybe the da the danger of becoming legalistic because you're thinking like well i need to not apply the gospel to my marriage or my fear or whatever but i just need to apply all the rules in the bible to it that that has a big danger to step into legalism. If you're not feeling that kind of religious, you may be, you know, and you look for other sources. You know, there's a lot of good books out there about marriage, and they're good. There's no doubt about it. But normally, they don't have the key gospel dynamic in them to be applied to your marriage or to your fear or to whatever. But there are many, many good things, even outside the Bible, with a lot of wisdom. But it is not the gospel, the, the, the gospel dynamic that is then applied. 
And I think that's what people then, either you become legalistic, that's one danger, or you uh, look to other sources and, and, and that's not, that's probably helpful, but it's not, it's not at all gospel dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in, in terms of performance right now, we are just, uh, Christianity tends to, there are lots of uh, rival answers when you're looking to live better or it may be your marriage or your health. And, and so right now, uh, and, and that's why it's so wrong when, when we live out our faith in terms of legalism, because if it's, it's, if it's, if it's about rules, there are infinite sets of rules outside of Christianity that even can look uh, that they, they, they work better than, than our faith. And so at the same time that we are called to live out, and so it, it, of course it, it will call our behavior, but presenting that in a way that what's at stake is not our ability to live better and sometimes it's, it's a temptation. We are trying to be good Christians, living better than other people. And, and we are supposed to live better, but the, the core of our faith is not outperforming the, uh, other people. And so uh, it's always a little bit... Um, th that's why it's so humbling when our faith can shine forth when we face our miseries and when we face our failures. And, and so th th this aspect of uh, sharing the gospel, looking at things going wrong, uh, sometimes it, it's, I think we are afraid of it, but we, 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 we really should engage with. And, and, and as pastors, we know that. Uh, there are lots of people that come for, for the first time in, in a church, in a local church, when they are going through the hardest time uh, times of their lives, and and of course we don't want to be overselling misery in our church, but but hope also comes with us giving up on looking too well accomplished and outperforming other people. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. if you look. If you look into history of church in Europe, I think you can see that there was a time when a lot of people, even outside the church, people who would not consider themselves very Christian, but would maybe come to the church as you know a place where you know, they would find some help and answer to some questions in life. And I think today most people would maybe not do that. Mm -hmm. A growing number that would not do it because they don't think that we can really give answers to questions in life. And I think they're right because we don't give gospel answers to our questions in life. We give sometimes legalistic or just tip, mm -hmm. tips or whatever, but we, we, we have kind of internally lost the ability as a church to apply our best thing. You know, the, 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 best, the, 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 best, the best invented thing that we have, the gospel, mm -hmm. every question in life. And I think that the rest of the people in, 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 around us are just right about well if if i have a question in life or if i have a problem or if there's something i want to you know invent or be become more happy or whatever um i will not go to the church because i don't have the answer and they're somehow right mm -hmm. and i think that it shows a little bit of the of the challenge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, i'm reminded of uh, a fellow german writer dietrich bonhoeffer who said that the one of the key jobs of christian fellowship is to for Christians to preach the gospel to one another. Yeah. Um, and that that does seem to be something that we've um, sort of lost the ability to do or the impulse to do um, is if, if we are not in the habit of preaching the gospel to one another, then it's that much more difficult to, to externally share and invite people into that gospel sharing that we're doing already. Mm -hmm. um, which may be a good uh, kind of transition point in the conversation here. Uh, let's assume that tomorrow um, your church has um, kind of recovered this ability to, to preach the gospel to one another and to apply the gospel to every part of their life. 
Um, what challenges externally in the sort of broader cultures that, um, uh, of, of Europe would, would those people encounter in trying to share the gospel with their um, fellow countrymen? Uh, what, what social cultural uh, obstacles are there for sharing the gospel in Europe? The first on this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the the hard. This is one of the hard questions. Um, <laughs> do, do you know? Uh, I I always uh, I've been thinking uh, about this. We all been thinking about this about what makes Europe Europe and what makes Europe uh, sometimes specifically a hard place uh, when talking about Christ. And, and I think one of the complexities here in, in, in Europe is that um, when talking about Jesus, sometimes um, it has to do with time. So sometimes if we, if we talk about Jesus, it will sound too old. Oh, we already know what that is. We were the ones taking it all through the world. So Christianity, it was what we Europeans did to the rest of the world. So we know way too much about how how it is, how it works, and, and, and how good it is for us not to engage with it anymore. So uh, Christianity so sounds too old and think, and, and people in a way kind of congratulate themselves because they already got rid of it. And at the same time, sometimes it sounds too new when it's being presented by people coming uh, the people more excited, of course, I'm again making a great simplification here, but in Europe, uh, sometimes the people more excited about Christian faith are not European, so they are coming from the global south. And when we hear Christianity coming from them, we, we, we feel that it's too new. So uh, when thinking about our past, we think it does, did not work. And thank God we don't need God anymore. But when hearing about Christian faith coming from, for instance, in Portugal, uh, is, is too connected with Brazilians. Evangelical, uh, evangelicalism is big in Brazil. And people will feel, oh, that's something coming out from countries where you are not that experienced with Christianity. So, uh, and even with the United States, people will look at the issue the same way. So when you spend some centuries uh, with Christianity, you will, you will end up in the place that we already are. And so you have this kind of, um, at the same time, it's too old and at the same time, it's too new. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this makes things a, a, a little bit complex, I would say. Mm -hmm. And maybe just adding to that, I think the, the, the group that delivers the gospel, so to say, or the, the group that sh wants to share the gospel with other people is the church. And the church kind of has a bad record in Europe somehow. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think it's unfair. I mean, the, yeah. the church has contributed a lot of positive things and still is yes. to the European culture, to many people, individuals' lives. Even. Uh, and I think it is an unfair picture about the church that people have in mind, you know, they, they kind of think that church is so, you know, discriminating and oppressing and and immoral, even in some cases, and they didn't care about the right things and the, the kind of the problem of the past. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it isn't that that is a challenge. Uh, uh, I mean, every time and you probably have that too, Tiago, every time when you meet someone and you share about what your profession is, your, your pastor or theologian or something, mm -hmm. they're always like, ah, okay. Uh, it's yeah. that kind of reaction, you know, yeah. that people think, oh, you're, you're, you're even professional in that thing that, you know, is kind of a problem of our past. Yeah. Well, another thing that I would point out is I think something that maybe is more a Central Northern European thing, but probably is, is, is growing everywhere the, you know, post-Christian thing is, mm -hmm. is, is more the normality, is that we're having a guilt problem. So we have a challenge with addressing or speaking the gospel into a reality that has no understanding at all about guilt anymore um, the gospel somehow you can use different words it's a message about a savior is is about something that is lost being saved or needs redemption or renewal 
So it is actually something positive that um, answers a problem. And the guilt problem that we have is basically denying the problem, um, is saying, no, we don't, th th there's no problem. People mm -hmm. are not lost. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't even have to talk about eternal life, but just on this side of life, people are not bad. There's no problem. Why don't we need your solution anymore? Mm -hmm. uh, that I think is part of the challenge. If you try to explain the gospel in a relevant way, and not just as a nice thing to have, like a Jesus app on your system, but okay. as something that is more profound. Um, there's something about the gospel that, you know, I'm, I acknowledge that I'm lost. And there's yeah. some, you know, using old words, you know, that I'm a, I'm a sinner or I'm a, uh, you know, there's something like that, that um, somehow needs to happen that you really get to love the gospel and it unfolds its power on you and your, your, your community. And that is the problem because we, in many parts of Europe, the idea that we are guilty uh, or that we are lost is, is somehow gone. So um, there are many reasons to it, but that is, I think, a huge challenge. I think in, in times when the gospel seemed to be more relevant for people in Europe, there was more an understanding of that they were guilty, that there's something we need mm -hmm. to give a record to someone, a report to someone one day, and there's a problem. I think the problem, people don't have the problem that at least in the way the church used to give the answer, um, we have the solution for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you know, listening to you talking about guilt, um, I'm trying, um, I, ho I hope this can um, make some kind of sense, but you know, right now I'm hopeful that our obsession with mental health will bring new opportunities uh, to talk about the gospel because I, I'm all in favor about being mentally health, healthy, mm -hmm. well, of course. But and, and mostly thinking about the coronavirus thing. And, uh, but you know, one of the interesting things is that we talk a lot about mental health in a way, I believe, because we lost the ability to engage with these issues not coming from a medical perspective and so mental health for instance is, is the way that we have to frame for me as a christian is the way that we have to frame facing darkness and and so i think that we are getting so obsessed about not being anxious that anxiety anxiety is is, is really building up to, to a standard that uh, Although medicine is engaging it, it will give us new opportunities to frame it in a biblical way. And, you know, life is full of darkness. And, and we have a, a, a library, a, a holy library in the Bible where darkness is all over. Of course, this does not sound to, um, at, 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 when we see it the first time, it, it sounds gloomy. But... I, 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 I would say that probably the Holy Spirit w will make it sound hopeful. And, uh, um, uh, you know, some of the people that during the years uh, had to engage me as a pastor, coming as non-believers, generally they, will co they would come from um, deep depressions and... Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, the, the curious thing, and the gospel explains that to us, because when we are weak, we are prone to, to, to see who, who we really are in a new light. Mm -hmm. And so we need some measure of, uh, of darkness to, to go looking for a light. And, and, yeah. and I'm hoping on that, 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 mm -hmm. that the churches can remain faithful, not, uh, not hiding all that's difficult about living. And you know, sometimes I think even the, the attractional, more attract, attractional model about being a church, one of it, it was lacking life when not working. And, and so it's a paradox, but I, I, um, I'm hoping on that. I, I'm seeing people uh, knocking at our doors in churches 
and because they are really going through terrible periods of their lives and and so they are they 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 get more available to listen to the gospel i don't know if this makes sense but yeah yeah and it's interesting i want to interrupt just a second and remind uh those who are watching that um we will have a time of q a at the uh in the next few minutes so please feel free to submit questions um wherever you're viewing this whatever platform you're viewing it on you can submit questions and those will make their way to us um but it back to your conversation it sounds like you're sort of describing the two of you different sides of the same coin in the sense that uh steph and i think you're right steph and i think you're right that the um uh, there is a growing sense in which people were hesitant to admit i think I'll, I'll describe the point of view from north america and and you can tell me if this applies in europe uh where you guys are but that there people are less hesitant to identify any problem inherent in themselves, right? That we don't like to admit that we are right. lost or broken or guilty or whatever, that we're okay. And we're more and more okay just being okay and kind of embracing ourselves. At the same time, we're deeply aware that things are not okay, yeah. right? And so the blame has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if it's not us, if it's not me, then it's corrupt institutions, maybe like the church or it's oppressive regimes a government or um it's it's uh, social structures that oppress or something so <clears throat> it seems that there's less maybe internalized sense of of the problem being with me and mm -hmm. but still a deep sense that there's a problem and i think mm -hmm. you're you're right tiago i i sense the cracks in that kind of we're all okay way of thinking about things because we are very concerned about our our mental health and our spiritual health and other things at the same time that we try to convince ourselves that we're fine just the way we are. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if um, that tension between surely I'm okay and I'm not guilty and yet things are bad and things need to be fixed <laughs> and things are broken. If there's an opportunity in that tension for presenting the hope in the light of the gospel. Yeah. I mean, Tiago already said it a little bit, you know, I, I mean, today our topic is what are the challenges? So we're mainly talking about that. But uh, before we can take a few questions in a minute, I definitely want to say there, I think there are amazing opportunities actually in Europe to share the gospel. I think the, there are many open doors. I don't know if the church yet is really looking at them or even focusing on them, but I think there are great opportunities. We probably cannot uh, take the old techniques or the old models of how we share the gospel with our neighbors um because they hardly work probably they might but not not that much anymore so we have to rethink it but if we go through the process of making the gospel real among us to every answer every question in life that will enable us i think to give good answers to all other questions in our in all the city and i do think that the gospel still is the best message even for people in the 21st century in every city in europe mm -hmm. and there is it still is like paul said the power of god that will um, that i'm not ashamed of and, and even 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 the other stuff you know, i'm i'm very happy about it and i'm you know it, it is the one thing that saves my life and not only my life my marriage my my, my whole city and i think that is uh, there's big opportunities i believe where uh, things happen in europe there are many stories that we could tell even from city city connections in Europe, how you know how beautiful it is and what happens when people hear the gospel and apply it. I would just add that, um, like you were saying, Stefan, uh, one of the great things about I think about uh, about the season we are going through is that. Um, and for instance, when we compare uh, the United States with Europe, uh, I would say that that probably if you're a Christian in Europe, evangelical Christian in Europe, you, you, you're, not, you're not that convincing if you are uh, talking about a triumphalistic message. And I'm not saying that that's what happens in the United States of America, but uh, 
here no one will remain a Christian because things are looking good or looking great. Mm -hmm. um, it's not our thing. It's not our story. It's not, it's now how, it's not how it works. And so, and in that sense, um, uh, it's like the other way around. So sometimes it's not that the gospel must be presented um, because bad things can happen and it should be because of that. But in Europe, the surprise, it's upside down. The gospel is presented because good things can happen. And, and of course, again, making this broad simplification, but it's like in Europe to believe that something could go right. It, it's the real scandal. So it's the real, um, how do you say, the, 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 the not the tumbling stone, the, 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 the rock that makes you fall, uh, uh, stumbling block. Uh, I, I think so okay. here happiness it's it's what it's what um, makes people mad <laughs> that you can believe that in a hope and 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 I'm hoping that we can sound convincing when talking about hope but um, it, it's good for us not to be trying to to remain away from our own cultural uh, backgrounds because sometimes it, it worked like that as evangelical Christians in Europe we would try to Americanize our our our, um, our lives and and so it doesn't work that way and, and and yeah I think we should be hopeful about the scandal of joy which is the the, the more hard thing that we have to preach that uh, even right now, I was preaching a, a, at Christmas and I was telling that uh, um, because this is what the gospel tells us, uh, God asks from us uh, uh, something that looks just impossible. Even when the angels come to the pastors is that you have to be joyful and be joyful is not, yeah, I was waiting for that. No, you were not waiting for that. And so it's a commandment and it's strange and it's unattainable in a way and that's what we are here to, to 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 talk about when talking about our lord jesus that's excellent thank you i in our last couple of minutes i i think it would be helpful you know we've we've been talking about europe in a broad sense and um europe is a complex and diverse uh continent and so we i i, I want to verbalize and be sensitive to the fact that we we recognize that the different regions of Europe have different um, temperaments, different histories, um, and uh, and different challenges for things like evangelism. So I'm curious, uh, in kind of the last couple of minutes, to maybe each of you could tell us what is one challenge that you think is sort of unique to the ministry context you're in, either your country or your city specifically and maybe one thing one feature of that context that makes you especially hopeful about the um the, the idea of sharing the gospel with uh in, in your city mm -hmm. so one particular kind of unique challenge and and maybe either how that challenge gives you hope or or something about that context that you find particularly hopeful yeah i'll, I'll make it short um I think that uh, the, the context most of the city city people live in is urban places. All urban places are growing and there's a growing group of urbanites. So it's, 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 it's a huge group all over the world, but you know, also in Euro European the cities, there are many people who want to live in cities. And in some sense, you know, that's a challenge because the church is a little bit late on that development. So we're not that good in going to the cities right now or in the last decade. But the thing that makes me hopeful is that I believe God loves cities. Uh, I believe that he, you know, the, the Bible is a whole story from the garden to the city. So if we, if, if there's an expert about urban life, then we have a God who has come to, you know, his city to, to, to redeem us all to live urban one day. And um, I think there's tremendous uh, hope that you know he he knows how to how to how to make his church real to an urban young generation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I would say that in the more in, in the southern uh, uh, countries in Europe, where the Protestant Reformation uh, didn't arrive and didn't did not build a, a culture. So one of the hard things for us is that sometimes we tend to go, we tend to be very good at confronting because uh, culture was never on our side. And so, and in that sense, it's interesting when you visit a, a country that was uh, influenced by the Protestant Reformation, um, because people, um, they are not at ease when they lose uh, influence, cultural influence. But that, that also, it, it also means that in a place like Portugal, and I would say that in Spain, in France, some parts of France, Italy, Greece, it can work like this, Romania probably, is that because you were you never fit in, so you tend to be some, sometimes a little bit careless about your own culture because you don't belong to it, and which is helpful when Christian when the place gets more secularized. It, one of the interesting things right now is even Catholics in Portugal, I think that they are starting to learn some things from from the evangelicals, from the Protestants, because they are losing their old grip on, on things. Um, and, and sometimes I, I really find it helpful when watching some of the culture wars, for instance, in the United States, uh, where, where some, some degree of uh, Southern European resistance would be helpful so that you can know that you can be a Christian when no one cares about you or don't even know no, no one knows about your uh, religious tradition. And so, um, although we tend to, to sometimes be careless about our own culture, at the same time, it's all about, there's a good measure of resilience and, and not hoping for everyone to be patting on your back because you believe the right, right stuff. And so, uh, yeah, this is one, it's a good thing, I think, that we can draw from our own experience here in Portugal. Yeah, I think one of the, the things that's consistent in uh, around the world right now in urban places is the migration that uh, Tiago, that you've alluded to where you have immigration, migration of Christians from all over the world to, to all parts of the world. And it will be really fascinating to see how that um, global movement will change what um, what Christian faith looks like in parts of the world, as you say, where uh, where the broader culture is so accustomed to many centuries of Christian influence mm -hmm. um, that they may just see something new when it's presented to them uh, from these uh, Christians who have come from from other parts of the world uh, and bring a leavening, uh, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. So, gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure to be with you um, in our conversation today. We have another conversation scheduled for the end of the month, January 28th. So uh, for those of you watching, please mark your calendars and uh, we'll be excited to have uh, to invade your living room for another conversation about evangelism in just a few weeks. And uh, until then, it's a pleasure to see you all. And uh, maybe we should get those dueling bases ready for a city to city Europe uh, event <laughs> <laughs> in the near future. When we can all be together, we'll torture one another with, <laughs> with, our, uh, with our trio. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. It's good to see you thank and you. good to be with you. And uh, I'm very thankful for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye.